Hello and welcome to Noise Creators episode 13. This week I'm here with, well, let's just be honest. I'm sure if you've listened this far, you probably know I'm not the biggest people person, but I'm usually enthused to do these. But today I get to talk with somebody who I truly actually love and enjoy as a friend, my buddy Pat Noon. Pat Noon is a Bayville, New Jersey, which is South Jersey for those of you who are lucky enough to be illiterate from that hellhole, uh, producer. And Pat does amazing work. What is nice about being friends with Pat is when I listen to his work, I go, I would never do that band that way, but the way he's doing it is absolutely incredible. I think Pat's one of the best up-and-coming producers there is out there. He gets a really realistic performance from bands that I really just appreciate. It doesn't sound like a computer ever made his record. It sounds like a band made his record. You may know these records. He's worked with groups like Brick and Mortar, The Front Bottoms, River City Extension, and Pat is just an awesome dude. You should go to his Noise Careers profile and get to know him. Check out his Spotify playlist, read his bio, check out his credits, and just get to know this awesome, awesome dude by listening to this podcast. I think we had a killer conversation, so check it out. One second before we get started with this interview. Noise Creators is able to do these cool podcasts because we're a service, and we're trying to get the word out about our service to people. So if you enjoy this podcast, it's really, really important that you share it to people so more people can get to know what we're doing trying to connect musicians with producers to make better music and make better records for you all to listen to. So please, please, please help us out. If you like this and like what we're doing, share it. Tweet it, Facebook it, Instagram it, Tumble it, whatever you like to do, do that. As well, we're going to start doing a really cool thing. If there's a great quote from these podcasts that you really enjoy, put it on a graphic, tweet it, Facebook it, take a picture of it, and send it to us at Noise Creators on every single one of the social networks. And what we're going to do is we're going to share the best ones, and if you're one of the best ones... We're going to send you a list of prizes we have. We have a bunch of cool, rare things from bands that aren't as much of a use to us. We have a couple of extras of rare pressings of vinyl, all sorts of cool stuff. You can choose from a list, and we'll send that out to you for free if you share a really cool quote that we like and we use. Thanks so much for helping out, and please, please, please help us spread the word on our service. Thanks. So what's the chain you're using to record your voice today? The BAE 1073 trying to look as I do it into I kind of stay with the distressor yeah pretty much straight in uh straight into Pro Tools what's the mic the Flea 47 oh nice and you have a Lawson 47 too right yeah a pair of Lawson's and then the Flea and the Flea kind of just blows them away really I didn't yeah. know that yeah because you were stoked on your Lawson when you first got it yeah I thought it sounded great and then <laughs> I mean I guess it's it's really not a night and day kind of thing, but it, the fleece definitely, the low end is a lot better. The It's just smoother all around. Just sounds like a fuller mic. I got to get a 47. It's like real dark and so it works for it works for the stuff today. But yeah, sometimes it gets a little dark, So, but it takes EQ well. So tell me about your background in music. It's probably like 14 or something like that. I started playing guitar, just doing like shitty pop punk stuff. And then started started recording like crappy demos on like uh you know the, the, the task amp four track like the cassette four thing and then kind of went you know record our own band and then record my friend's bands and then just kept playing in bands and stuff like that and then got sick of booking shows and moving gear and stuff like that and i was kind of like well i could probably make it work with the recording i know it seemed to have not that it was a profitable business at the time but to me, it seemed a lot more interesting than, you know, playing venues to six people. and It definitely is more appealing. <laughs> so at this point, I just kind of noodle around on guitar and stuff like that, but I don't really play anymore. So tell me about the transition from those. So you're like, doing the band, and like, when does it become clear to you that you're going to be a producer? Well, I always just kind of did it, trying to figure out how to really do it for years. And then uh, I think I it didn't really hit me to like, oh, I, I can do stuff that, that I think really sounds good until... A few years in, really, um, but it really it was after the first my first band's full length. It was like the first full length. It was I think the first project I ever fully did on Pro Tools too, where I don't think it sounded great, but I was like, oh, I can, 
I can make like a, a full length happen. Like I can figure out how to pull it all together and and make it all work. And so you you were talking about g guitar. Is that the only instrument you play? No, I can play bass. I can kind of noodle around. Uh, I guess enough on piano to sort of show an idea or something like that. But but that's about it. I used to play trumpet. Oh yeah, I used to play <laughs> I trumpet. That. Yeah. Um, so, so I should also say for the background for our listeners, you and I have been friends for I think it's like getting close to ten years now, like eight, ten years, something in that area. Yeah, yeah, it was probably probably oh five or yes, yeah, so it's been oh, like ten. wow. So when these answers sound familiar to me, the listener should know it's because we've talked extensively over the years and we're good friends. Um, when you have your own studio, eight sixteen. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we got so there's there's six rooms. Uh, it's it's a rehearsal and recording studio. So, um, but every room can be recorded out of. So there's a main control room, then the main tracking room, then there's a another room that could be used for drums. There's a editing mixing sort of room in the front, and then another room where we do a lot of the hip hop stuff with another live room attached to that. So it kind of just depends on the project and depends on what we're doing. You know, is what room is used for what. Or if it's a full band that sometimes we get some some jazzy stuff that, you know, they have to do it all live. The, the guys kind of just aren't used to headphones. So if everything's got to be separated, stuff can get put in different rooms and not have to worry about bleed or any of that. I mean, really, this place was has been here since 98, and it was always just like a rehearsal studio. What's up? Yeah, so, so somebody else built this initially and then you've just been adding on to it? Yeah, and sort of tweaking it. Like, it was always a rehearsal studio that could, like, kind of make you a crappy demo was kind of like always their thing and then you know been trying to just turn that around for the past this is the start of the fourth year already wow that at, time at flies man jeez <laughs> feel old <laughs> so tell me about something that makes your studio unique actually i think it's probably the rehearsal side of it really because to me i don't want to own a rehearsal studio i don't want to uh sell accessories and stuff like strings and sticks like we do but i just happen to have it and that just happens to pay the bills so as far as recording i can for for bands that i think are good bands or they're they're working hard or people like them they have potential i can i don't have to like stare at a clock and and whatever i can always help those bands out do records for cheaper or something like that and so we don't have to worry about time i think that's some studios that that uh you know, charge a ton of money and stuff like that. Bands are sort of like, oh, that would be a cool idea if we did whatever with the guitar tone, but like, you know, they're kind of looking at their watch. That's going to cost me 300 bucks. So I can kind of make it so the bands don't really have to worry about that stuff. It's really just about making making a, a great album. That's, that's a good approach, and I think that's an interesting thing, too, that like you're able to have more of a passion project because you have this thing that's supporting you on the side. Yeah, like, and I, I don't think I've ever gotten paid what I would say I like to get paid to do a record. <laughs> but I guess that's probably all of us. So. Yeah, I, well, you know, it's really funny because I can't say that is everyone. Like, you know, doing this, like, there is some people who are really diligent about, like, I'm going to only do the hours I'm paid for. And then there are those of us who go and just are going to do every hour until the thing is right. Yeah, like, I can't, like, I'll lose sleep on shit or something like that. Like I just, I'm doing mix changes today on, on some, some album that like I gave him a flat rate for mixing and it's just, I've gone way over it and I just can't like, like I'll come back down in the studio at like 1230 night and be like, ah, I gotta, I gotta fix that and resend it to him. That is the, uh, torture of, <laughs> of this is like that, that thing of there's nothing worse than feeling great and then taking that ride home and then all of a sudden it's like, oh no, I didn't get that right. That's pretty cool. I didn't even realize that that, that was something you were able to, to do with the more flat rate stuff to make the projects work. And I think that's why your stuff, one of the reasons your stuff sounds so good. Yeah, to me, it's like uh, time is way more important than, than anything else. Like I'd rather have, you know, two days with a 57 or something and a, and a and then like, you know, an hour of renting the sickest gear and the, you know, whatever, just the extra time to, to make it work is, is always the most important to me. I, I am a hundred percent with you. And I think that that's one of the, the things that bands miss a lot of time when they're making records is they think if they're just in the sickest studio with the coolest looking window and the nice polished wood, that's going to make it work when really it's like time and consideration goes a lot farther than. Yeah. I love, I quote that all the time. From yeah. I guess it was, it was in your book, right? 
I, I mean, I definitely, yeah, yeah, that was a blog post and then it went in the book, but yeah, it really is. Yeah, I've had the the second band, second band this month that came from a studio that was like like that, and they just didn't have time and started really running out of money and, and then just came to me with the files to like fix it up and finish it and mix it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's just that thing, and I think sadly that is just like one of those rookie mistakes and bands realize it at the time, but what's a shame is it's like, it takes, you know, not having a few songs not come out as good to learn that lesson. Yeah. I like to do this span thing of like, on one side you have Steve Albini, who really doesn't like to get involved aside from saying, yeah, I think that take was good with the production. And then you have like a John Feldman who fully rewrites the songs for you. Where, where do you see yourself on that scale? Probably a little more Steve Albini. I mean, I'll definitely, definitely make suggestions. And if I feel strongly about something, I'll... You know, I'll kind of really try and push for it, but ultimately, to me, it's it's their record in the end. Like, you know, I just listened to his. He did that podcast, the the Mark Maron podcast, where he yeah. talks about how he doesn't he doesn't want points or anything like that. Yes. Um, I I kind of feel it's, it weirds me out talking about extra money and and things like that. I don't know why I feel that way, and it I guess it makes sense that if you know if people are are helping write stuff and things like that, maybe they should get paid, paid down a line. But to me, it's just this is what I want for the day and. And I'm gonna do my best and write whatever you need written. Uh, if you need a, a vocal tweaked or uh, you know you're not good with harmonies and and things like that. See, but that's the thing. So you're saying you fall more on the Albini thing, but you're saying you'll also help with harmonies and help writing parts, which I think is much more like while it's not John Feldman, that's I think a little bit more the center of the spectrum. Yeah, like I'll yeah yeah I guess you're right. And then. Uh, you know, as far as like, uh, maybe, you know, that lyric, you could probably have a better, a better way to say that or, or things like that, you know, or different, different lead parts. Maybe if you change, change this note or something. So I'll definitely like, I'll definitely say stuff, but as far as a total rewrite and, you know, really like totally take a song apart and put it back together. That's not really, that's not really my thing. Yeah. I, so, so I guess so, it's a little so, more so, in the middle. So yeah, you're, yeah. I, 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 I like to think of that as like the middle of the spectrum is that like, you can do the harmony work if you want. You can help write a drum fill if somebody's not getting it, or a guitar part, or something like that. If it's not working, you can help rewrite it. Yeah. Obviously, every record is different, but what would you say, like, if you interviewed the last 20 bands you worked with, they would say you bring to a record most often? I would hope they think that, or they would say, or I think that most people that I've worked with would say that I'm extremely honest about things, uh, of whether I like their part or not whether i think it's good enough or not or you know because you hear a lot of stories about people who they've recorded with someone and dude just sits there presses record and just like ah, oh, it's your record uh i just can't yes <laughs> you know, I, I, if i could even give the outside testimonial of you you, you don't keep your opinion to yourself very well <laughs> it's a good quality in you because at least you know that you can be wrong and you're humble about it but it's definitely going to come right out people have actually said to me that if if I say that it's good, then they, they believe that, that it's actually good, which I don't know. You know, I'm, no, not, I'm not saying that I know what's best for everything, but you know what I mean? Like it's passing somebody who's annoyed by a lot of things. <laughs> you got to like tactfully kind of, yeah. I think that's the thing is your honesty comes from a sincere place and that's why it's respected. Yeah. I, you know, I was just working with this, this band from from Philly that uh, I've done a ton of stuff with them over the years, and they came. They were supposed to spend last weekend here, and like weren't really prepared. And then was kind of just like we needed to add a verse to something, and they just sort of like were winging it on the spot. And I was just like, just go home. <laughs> I was just like, I love you guys, but get out of here because you're just this is crap. You know, go home, rewrite your stuff. Call me, you know, they're coming back again in a month. So it's like just things like that. Where it's like, I, I, you guys came here, you know, you, you booked the weekend, but I don't want your money. Just go home, write a better, you know, write some better parts. I'd rather have a better, a better song and final product. Agreed, and it, it's it's just so funny because like you know, there's so I, I guess that is another thing that the rehearsal thing affords you to do is that you're able to still do that stuff. But that's the nice thing about being busy is that it's like, okay, I can afford to tell you the truth because I don't have to worry about that. Now I'm going to lose the money for the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So what's a common mistake you see bands do before getting to the studio? They, 
never know each other's parts, which I think is really important. So what do you mean by know each other's parts? Like the, like the one guitar player will be, or the bass player will be like, you know, hearing the guitar part, uh, play. And be, oh, I can never tell what you're playing in practice. That's, that's a cool lead. <laughs> just little things like that that it's like when I like when I used to play in bands I wanted to know every part that my other guitar player was playing and I wanted to know the bass lines I wanted the bass player to know the guitar lines and I wanted everyone to know the lead vocals and everyone to be on the same page and know everything and then cuz then it just comes out better like you're more prepared when you get into the studio uh everyone knows what they do or don't like a lot of times the, the entire band isn't here at once and then you do like the lead guitar and then like the bass player comes like, I don't like that lead. No. It's like, oh, well, you've never heard that before? Like <laughs> things like that. And then a lot of it is, is usually with the, the bass and the drums that the bass player is usually just has no idea what the kick, the kick pedal's doing. Mm -hmm. yes. So trying to, trying to rework that. Um, a lot of drum, it's a lot of drummer stuff, overuse of cymbals, I think. Uh, but that's all pre-production stuff that you can kind of, kind of help out help tweak before you actually start yes and demos it's so easy for bands to just put up a you know like their iphone and make a voice memo of just demos of their practices and then listen to it and help change things from there agreed and sadly yeah that that even sometimes doesn't happen i think you made a really good point and like you know i ask this question a lot in these podcasts and no, no one mentions that and i didn't even really think about that but like you know how much it is a thing that if you're really informed and you've really paid attention to what the other person's playing, you can think about your relationship. And like, I think like one of the things that we were even just talking about that it gets to a good point of is like consideration of like, when you have the time to think more and put more thought into your songs than just like chug, chug, chug. And then we should all be hitting that and you think about the things that the other person's doing and how you can bring that relationship to a better place. Like that's what goes into making great records. It's like you're going to play chess, but you don't know how the rook moves or something. <laughs> I like, like that. I'm not, I'm not gonna worry about that piece. And it's like well, you're not gonna win. <laughs> yes. I, I, I like, like that a, a lot. You know, we're like a football team. Everyone you know, everyone's gotta be on the same page for it to for it to work. Can you make sports references on a? <laughs> you, 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 you know, funny enough, almost everybody do, does make that, that those references, and you know, they just go right over my head. <laughs> so, what's a smart thing you see bands do while they're in the studio? I guess the counter of what I just said is uh, some of them do come in with with like little setups, uh, like little recording setups, and you know, like the the last one I did had some like electronic kind of stuff that wasn't really ready until we started getting the guitars and drums and stuff down. And then he was off in the other room, you know, with like logic or whatever he was using, uh, you know, working out like, Oh, can you just give me a bounce of this stuff? I'm going to just try and come up with some, some of the electronic parts and things like that, that, that everyone's got a laptop and it's so easy for, for bands to kind of just work out little things while they're here. You know, if I'm doing a vocal and it's like once the vocal's done, you know, maybe we'll do some some more leads or something like that. Which go in the other room and you know work work that stuff out. A lot of them kind of have little setups too that they can do that on the side as we're doing some other parts. Almost every band can do that. Like, how many bands do you meet that don't have a laptop that's capable of that? And yet, so many don't take advantage of that. Yeah, most of them just sit here on Facebook and it's like, why don't you guys open up? <laughs> Let's open up whatever program we got. Yeah, or just like you just said, check out the, the strumming patterns, make sure those are locked, everything. Yeah, it's a lot. You know, bands don't know, oh, that's that's the rhythm that you play on guitar? Because when you're trying to do doubles, it just becomes a nightmare. What's a good lesson you've learned from another producer? I guess I was kind of assisting when a band went to, to someone else, and just his use of time was just horrible. He was like, you guys... So t tell me about the use of time, yeah. Yeah, just like, you know, we were supposed to start it, it was going to be a 10 to 8, I, th I think, were the hours, and, I don't know, dude would kind of roll in around 10.45, and then kind of play around for a little bit, we'd start maybe tracking something from 12 to like 1, and then it was lunchtime, and then, you know, maybe track something else, and then he'd go make a phone call to his wife, and then it was just like, what, you guys are paying for this full day? What is going on here? Just kind of looking around like, what, what the hell is going on? Like I kind of never stop. I'll eat as we're tracking. Uh, you know. Yeah, you and I, you and I do that same thing. Is it's it's uh, e eating at the desk while we're still going and giving an instruction with a mouthful of food sometimes. And he was a pretty you know pretty well known dude. So I learned how to, I learned that I need to work harder 
mm-hmm. uh, more efficiently, I guess, is, uh, I don't know. Well, I think there's a, it's a funny thing is, is like, there's a lot of producers that think like, wow, you know, we have 10 hours today. That's plenty of time to waste. And the rest, there's a lot of us who are like, wow, we have 10 hours. That's not enough time to get done what's in the day. And, yeah. you know. Uh, that 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 is a very big fundamental difference in how you run your day. Yeah, especially when you're booking by the day. You know, if, if you're having bands pay day rates, then it's like you know, if you say it's a ten hour day. I mean, to to me, it usually winds up being eleven or twelve. Mm. Uh, yeah, learn you know that you have to just go that extra. You know, because they weren't happy with the product, so I kind of learned that you have to go, you have to go above and beyond for everyone all the time. You know, you got to. The Beatles started as a shitty nobody band, you know? Uh-huh. So, like, who knows? So maybe he didn't treat this band as, uh, you know, he's like, oh, whatever, I don't, I do bigger stuff than this. Who needs these guys? And that attitude of, like, you have to treat every band like they're the biggest band. I, I, you know, I, I think one of the fun, best lessons of that, of my career, I always say is, like, most of the bands that have done really well, like, some I know, like, it's pretty obvious, but a lot of them, like, the the only Top 40 record I ever worked on, uh, I was like, this is never going anywhere, but I still gave it my all, even though I thought 15 kids in their college dorm would hear it, and instead it was on Top 40 radio. Yeah, you never know, it's crazy. <laughs> and, and it's just that thing of, like, if you do that, it's like, then you're sitting there thinking about, like, oh, I really wish I did a better job on that thing, and this thing, and that thing, and, like, I always think about, um, like brand new with Deja and Tendu talks about that. Like how they went around trashing how bad the production job was on that record and how much they hated it. And it's like, God, that's gotta be like so bad that like a band still is successful. And yet, you know, they're slagging the producer everywhere they go. Right. Yeah. That's not what, that, that's not what you want to have happen with your breakout record. Yeah, no. Yeah. You never know. Like you might do something that you think is whatever. And then seven years later, the band is like, Oh, people like these guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's when you start putting their name on your website and stuff. Like, Oh, you know what I did? <laughs> yeah. That, 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 that is a funny one too. Or you never know, you know, there's someone who's going to be wine. He's going to wind up on some, some show in a couple months that I did his his album, I don't know, four years ago. Uh-huh. And then all and of a like, sudden Yeah, it's like, oh shit, people are gonna people are gonna go back and listen to that. <laughs> yeah. I, but I, you know, so if you sort of slacked on it or you're just like, yeah, whatever, who cares about this thing? It's like it, it's gonna come back to haunt you. I agree. And I think it's also just really important that you take people's dreams seriously because this is somebody's dream. Like ninety percent of the time. Sometimes they're doing it just to get it done and have it, have it for themselves. But 90% of the time it, they're dreaming of this being something great that the world is moved by. Yeah. And you're like, people take off of work to come to you, you know, like people have jobs and whatever. And then like, you know, their leisure time to try and do something better or something different or more, you know, whatever, if they're doing it to try and become a big band or some people even do it just, you know, just for fun, they come to record and like, they're taking their time off and stuff like that to come to you. So for you to not take it as serious, you know, as they take it, it's just, you know, it's terrible. What happens when you and a bad disagree about something? (laughs) I mean, I'll, if I feel strong enough, I'll, I'll fight for it. But, uh, you know, ultimately it, it is to me, it is their record and it's their band. So, I mean, they win in the end. I mean, sometimes it gets to where we, I just got back masters from some band that I just, we just stopped seeing eye to eye. And I was like, you know what? You guys should take this and go mix somewhere else. Cause I don't, I'm not going to give you what you want. So you should take the files and go, you know, it wasn't like a big fight or anything like that, but you know, I have no problems like giving an album away or, you know, if I think it's for the better, I don't like the way it came out, but you know, I'll try and be like, you know, who do a good job. Uh, you should call this guy or you should, you know, mm-hmm. or yeah, like, the, you know, the band I sent you, I was like, yeah, you should call, you should call Jesse. He'll love to mix this. <laughs> Well, it's, it, it's that, 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 that thing, though, is like also having that humility of like, hey, you know what? I, I, I think you, you and I are probably the same as that. Like 99 out of 100 bands we get, we're going to see eye to eye with and we're going to have a good thing. But that one out of 100, it's good to be able to be honest and say like, hey, this isn't working and you should try to find a better solution. Yeah, like I don't – like if a straight up like new metal band comes to me, like – I probably won't do the greatest job and I don't want, I don't want to just take someone's money. So it's kind of like, yeah, uh, you know, uh, I could track it. Maybe someone else should mix it or maybe you should just entirely go, you know, go somewhere else. Yeah. I, I used to have on my website back in the day. I'm like, if you sound like trapped, 
you probably don't want to come to me because I don't want you to succeed. <laughs> uh, it's like it's the same thing. It's like you know, if it, like your biggest influence is falling in reverse in Attila today. I'm just like I'm not gonna want to do this. Yeah. So, and I, you know, I just you basically I opt out of that with the same thing. And like I think that that's a, that's a, a nice thing about being honest with uh, records. Yeah, like the you know the band that I was just working with, they. Uh, we initially everything was supposed to be this sort of spacey kind of organic ish, I don't know, cold play ish rock almost. And then I don't know what happened, but towards the end of it, they're like, listen, we got to like auto tune this and that. We got to like do this and that. I'm just like, listen, I'm not tuning anything because your singer's great and we don't need it. And I'm going to open it up and look at Melody and be like, I don't know what to do because it sounds great. So you can go somewhere else and have someone else ought to tune it all you want, but I'm not the guy anymore. Well, and so that that actually segs really into our next questions, which is like one of the things I really appreciate about your productions is they sound like natural performances where the computer hasn't gotten too involved, which is pretty rare these days, while still having good performances that don't sound like, you know, there's like plenty of people who make, Records where it's like, oh, they didn't use a computer, but you're like, and then there's flaws everywhere, and it's fucking annoying, and it's loose, and it's got shitty things, but you get good performances without it sounding like it's a computer. So tell me about the role pitch correction has in your production. I mean, I'll definitely go to it if if it's needed, but I'm... You know, I'm more of the, I'll try and just punch in syllables or I'll just try and like do different comps of, you know, a word or something like that, so... And I mean, if we really need it, I guess the genre dependent, really, you know, I'll use it a little bit, but as far as like the straight up auto tune sound that I don't know, it's just not my, I kind of hate it. So it's like, I can't really bring myself to do it. I don't know. You know, it's just hard when you're just like, someone wants to sound a certain way and it just kind of makes you cringe. It's like, I don't know if I can do this, <laughs> but I will, you know, there's certainly tons of, I guess, emo-ish type stuff that I've done that, that is tuned, but I try and keep it as natural and smooth as I can. Toy, I think you do a gr- without the sine wave tone. Yes, actually, that's a good. That's a good way of putting it. The, the the sine wave. How about amp simulators? Do they have a role in your production? Yeah, uh, scratch tracks usually. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. There's something about. I'm sure I've heard records that are amp simulators, and I've thought that the record sounds great. But to me, when I hear it, I don't know if it's just being snobby, but I don't, it just feels like there's no soul or something in in any of those. Like any of the. I don't know. I still just I still just mic amps all the time. I am right there with you. It just still doesn't totally tickle my fancy. Uh, there's just always something missing when I go to the last thing. If I uh, try to put that on a record, yeah. And I never like like reamping's not. I'm not really big into that. To me, it's very like I don't know. Just get get the tone, commit to it, and let's move on. How about sampled drums? I probably use triggers in, in mostly everything, but it's I try not to have it audible so much. It's more of just like a slight fattening up of something, or if like I don't know for some reason the uh, the hi hat's a little too on the snare mic, I might you know slide a sample in there to kind of be able to to kind of even the balance out a little bit. But I don't do as far as like the machine gun kick drums and machine gun snares and stuff like that. I I don't even really know how to do it. Actually, I've tried to do it. And <laughs> it's, it doesn't it's, 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 it's funny because the way to do it is just lo- lots of lack of concern about the trigger dynamics. <laughs> I mean, I've even tried to you know have them blaringly loud, and it's just like this just sounds stupid. Where some producer can get it to see like I still think it kind of sounds stupid, but it sounds like it's supposed to sound for that genre. But I mean, I don't really. I don't really listen to music like that, so it's hard for me to, to kind of do that kind of thing. But I definitely, you know, I'll make triggers of stuff and, and slide it in there if, if we need it. You know, never mind had triggers on the yeah. drum. You, uh, can't, well, you, you know. Well, I think that's, that's the funny thing is, like, Andy Wallace is that great example. Like, um, my buddy Alop and I, like, we'd always talk about that. Is like, he did that interview back then, and, like, he talked about how, like, every record Andy Wallace, so, like, you think of all these classic records that he's at least – putting a trigger that goes to the reverb alone to just get the reverb to sound consistent from snare hit to snare hit. Yeah. And so at, at minimum that was being done. And, you know, he had his assistant prep it before, obviously, since triggers took a million years back then. But, you know, this is not a new technology. Like so many people think of triggers like, oh, that started with Pro Tools around 1999. It's like, no, people have been doing that for a lot longer. 
Yeah, and they kind of, you mention it in like the, uh, quote, purists or whatever they think they are that kind of like cringe at it. You know, you don't know how your some of your favorite records were made. So it's like uh, someone said, you know, when you said amp simulators, it's like for using maybe like, you know, organ simulators or, you know, virtual instruments. Uh, someone was like, well, that's that's stupid. Why would you why would you use that? And I'm just like, you think every record that you've ever heard that you love has actual organs and actual pianos and none of its keyboards or anything like, come on. And it doesn't really it doesn't matter how you get to the final uh, the final product, just as long as it's great. You know, my controversial quote is um, that statement, the end that justifies the means, the only time it ever works is in Nazism and making great art. <laughs> and we all know it didn't turn out so well for Nazism. <laughs> but it's true for a great art. It doesn't matter how you, you get there. It just matters that you got there. Like, it really does not fucking matter as long as you're able to make it work. Yeah, it's only a bad idea if it sounds like shit. Yeah. So do you master your own records? No. No. Uh, I feel like the second I touch the master bus that I have ruined everything. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, and I'd rather, I don't know, I'd rather not even have the extra money. F you know, it's like, I know the idea of, of mastering and whatever, and I could work up a pseudo master, but I'd rather just send it off to an actual mastering engineer to, so the album comes out better. How long do you like to take to work on a song usually? I guess it's really band band dependent, but usually it's a pretty full day for to track it. Maybe a couple extra hours for some little extra things that maybe need to get redone or added, and then and then it's usually about a half day to mix it. So day start to finish about a day and a half. Yeah, that's that's pretty in line with like what we uh, we're, we're normally we normally hear here. I think you just did touch on something though too that like it's like one of those questions I wanted to work into this podcast. So, so what is redoing things? How does that figure into your thing? Like, we talk about commitment so much, and, like, you and I were both on that same page of, like, you commit to a guitar tone, but, you know, I, I think one of the biggest production secrets is not being scared to redo things when they're not working. Yeah. So where does that play in your productions? You know, maybe the next day, maybe, like as you start hearing the whole album pulled together, it's like, ah, you know, that, that vocal take on the second song, just, you know, all the other ones just sound better. I don't know why, just something about it just sounds better. Let's just redo the vocal, you know, something like that. There's no problems in redoing. I mean, now, now when you're recording is the time to be picky as opposed to, you know, that extra time you took to redo it. You're not going to remember that like three years later when you go back and listen to the album. Yes. That, that's a, that's actually a great point. Uh, is that, I think so many bands don't have it in their head. They have it in their head there now instead of their later. And the later of making a record and being happy with it is so much more important than the now of the pain of doing something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to go back to something, you know, however long and be like, ugh, we should have taken that extra 20 minutes and, you mm -hmm. know. Punched in that, that, that vo vocal part where you sound like a uh, big bird <laughs> honking over uh, the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> You know, sometimes you just miss, you know, sometimes you just miss it. You're just like, ah, oh, that take was great. And then, I don't know, the next day you're like, wait a minute, was it? Was it great? But most of the time, you just got to trust your instinct and, and go with it. Agreed. So so tell us about one of the best moments you've had in the studio. Um, one of the best, let's see. Uh, it might have been that, that River City record when <laughs> I remember talking to you when uh, I was like, oh, this is terrible. I got to live out in this house for a month we we uh yeah, so, set, so set, set up what you what you guys did for this last river city extension record i pretty much took my entire studio uh and my upright piano and we threw it all in the van and their trailer and went to it was basically a log cabin in the poconos and just set up there and made one of the bedrooms was like the control room and then just used the rest of the house for everything else you know now looking back at i i think that might be I think it might be the my favorite album that I've done. Too bad no one like no one bought it, but uh, <laughs> but th going back and thinking about it now, it's like the the control room. Like there was this huge like like window looking out into like uh, I don't even know what you call like these rolling hills up in the Poconos, and it's like we were there for so long that like it was from spring into summer, I guess. So you could see like the the leaves were like coming out throughout the record and stuff like that. And it's just, I don't know. And for some reason that the main living room just sounded great as a drum room it had these like, uh, like cedar plank 
like all around the whole the whole room and it was just cool just being all you did was like there was nothing out there you just woke up and you worked and everything was just about the album you know for three three weeks i think we were out there nice yeah, I think I, th- I think it's it's one of those things is like the um, Larry Crane from Tape Op had like this fantastic quote. It, it was like, "Here's a sad thing I've learned like interviewing producers for years: the record that's your favorite one that you think is your best work is also the same as the one that no one hears." <laughs> and for me, it's totally true. Like the my favorite record I ever produced, it came out nine years after I did the final mix. Jesus. <laughs> it never got promoted and anything and it was just like it was one of those things it was just like that's how it goes like the only place anybody hears that usually is my uh reel that i have like the mix i have from soundcloud on my uh website oh it's up there huh. yeah like i have like one of the songs on there that's probably the way, way that song's been heard the most so yeah it's a shame <laughs> that's that, that's sadly i think how it goes sometimes so tell us about one of the worst moments you've had and what you learned from it. I was, this was like, I guess, towards the beginning. I never, it was before I would make certain bands, uh, you know, I guess genre-wise, play to a click. Some stuff's not always to a click, but this band definitely should have been, and I, I didn't do it. And so we recorded the tracks, and then a couple days later, the guitar player was supposed to was supposed to come in and, and put some solos, some shredding leads over all over it. And the timing was, was pretty messed up, which, you know, is my job to make sure that that didn't happen. But so he's trying to go back in and put it in and like things are off time and he's just playing. He's not even listening to the band. He's just like shredding and then like just getting madder and madder as he, as he's like, uh, you know, I was like, ah, oh, that's, you're off with the drums. Like you want me to turn the drums up? And he's just like, eventually like just sits down and he's just like, I am playing in perfect metronome timing. And then he like puts he, like, he puts his like pointer finger up in the air and he's like I'm dealing with fucking amateurs and then he like he takes his guitar off like throws it across the room whoa and just like walks out the back uh, of the studio and like slams the door and I'm just sitting there like this guy's gonna murder me <laughs> holy <laughs> shit and then he just comes back in he's just like I can't deal with they just I don't know, had a meltdown in front of me and then and then just left. And the, the project never got finished. But so what wow. I learned is that some bands you have to make them play to a click. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, that was crazy. I saw, I've told tell that story so many times. It's just amazing. Amateurs. You never story? told me that. That's a great story. I, th- I thought we, between you and I, <laughs> like what we do is we call it and call each other up and talk about our worst stories. I think that might have been before I met you. This no, is like be so why. long. Yeah, this was like real early, and. Uh, I mean, he was like a total like '80s like hair metal guy playing in like a I don't even know what the band was supposed to be. They were so all over the place. But <laughs> so I'm playing in perfect metronome timing. It's like what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> well, but I, but but I think though the the greater lesson is there that it's like you know you really can't build on a unstable ground of drums like you got to make sure that that drumming is the right feel and even and like right feel even like so many people get confused that that's like i beat detective it every hit is on it's like well if that guitarist plays with a lot of feel that's going to sound like shit when every beat is actually just dead on and robotic yeah i think a lot of people don't know that one you know i another well, I don't know if it's a worst moment, but it's a general like worst thing is I think when like when you have recorded a band or a couple things for a band and then it's just like, I don't know, you'll see like an Instagram post or a Facebook post or something like that or just like in the studio recording and it's like somewhere else. It's just like, what? Yeah, that, 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 that's always a tough one to, to deal with. Like, I think as a producer, you, you, you have to get used to that. Um, it's not like a relationship where you get cheated on. It's like the, the nature of it, of that, like, you know. Most people don't marry the girl they lost their virginity to. <laughs> yeah. They want to try out other things, and yeah, sometimes they come back, but like that, that, that is the thing. But that's also, I guess it's a good thing too, because then it kind of, I mean, for me, it sort of like makes me insane. Like it's like, uh, you know, why? And then I need to hear it, and then it's like something like I, I have to do whatever the next thing is needs to just be better than that. It's, I don't yep. know. No, I, I, I go through this, the this same thing. And you know, like, I had a tough one recently. It was like, we, like not only was the band I, I love listening to, but they're like some of my closest friends. 
and then they went somewhere else and it's like that thing of like it was hard to do but they were like very insistent like we don't want our sound to depend on you and i'm like oh wow oh damn <laughs> like that's 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 something all right yeah so uh, y- you know it, th- there's so many reasons a band could do it but yeah learning to deal with that is a, is a tough one you're not a big beatles fan right or you are I'm, but I, I, I'm one of those people that if i never heard the beatles again i'd, I'd kind of be fine with it I, I did enough listening when i was young <laughs> but you know they kind of you know they stayed with uh with george martin and jeff emmerich and it didn't work out for them <laughs> <laughs> well wait they went to uh phil specter for that for let it be though right yeah, didn't, they hated it though, right? Yeah, they, they and, then he, it, yeah. and then he, and then he like, and then a dude murdered his wife or something. So it's like you should yeah. probably just. <laughs> you should probably. Well, I don't know. You can even go into Radiohead with Nigel Godrich. They did the one record with Spike Stent, and then they scrapped it um, and never released that. I think that still has never come out. The stuff they did with Spike Stent. So yeah, and you, you know, you two spent most of their stuff with Daniel Lemoyne and and uh, I guess a lot of it was Brian yeah, Eno, Brian and, Eno yeah. White and Steve Lily White mixed most of it, right? Yes, well, I think Steve, so. I think Steve Lillywhite was a different like Steve Lillywhite is all the era before Lenoir and uh, Eno, I believe. I might not be right about this. I, I admittedly like I'm one of those people like I was just saying this yesterday. It's like the three bands whose present catalog made it so I can't listen to any of the rest of their catalog. You two, <laughs> Metallica and Coldplay. I used to love some of their material. All their newer catalog makes it so I never want to hear anything they've done. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's get into some personal stuff about what you like in music. Um, tell me about the record you did that changed you the most in your career. Like, what is there a record that really changed how you saw things, the way you do things, anything like that? I think it was the first time I did drums with you, actually. Uh, that is dude Ted Hammock. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think that was the first record that I was actually, like, really happy with. I think that I was like, oh, I don't know what happened. I kind of just felt like I was mixing like I had always mixed, but for some reason it just seemed to come out. I, and I still think it sounds great going back and listening to it, which doesn't happen. You know, usually going back, you kind of just like, Ugh, I wish I did this different or that different, you know. But that was, I think that was the first record that I was just like, oh, I can get stuff to really sound good, I think. You know, and then from there, and as far as like probably the River City and Brick and Mortar's first stuff is I got like so much work from from their early stuff that I mean that changed a lot of it was like I think I had a, a job I was working for Captain Morgan or something at the time and then I did those two albums and then I didn't I didn't need another job anymore that 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 it, it does seem to be what happens if you find those bands that are influencing all the other bands that's that's the key like it's always funny to me is like I say to people it's like you know if you work with bands other bands respect you get work but whereas if you work with bands that only 15 year olds listen to you get a record that's successful that does nothing for your career. Yeah, and that kind of brings it back to the uh, what we were talking about at the beginning, where it's like if a band is really good and you know, and it's like they got potential and drive, and they're gonna push this record, and people seem to like them. You know, those are the ones to to really. I guess it's worded wrong. It's gonna say go all out, but you always gotta go all out. But like, yeah, the shitty bands uh, are the ones you're really just taking a paycheck for, and that doesn't get you anywhere. Yes, it, 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 it is it is the case. And, that's, and you know, and sadly, it's like you do that and you practice, but I always say it's like what I take for the shitty bands is, is I take that as like if I can make this band sound great, then I'm going to do even better when a great band comes in. Yeah. So what's a perfect record that somebody else has made and why is it perfect? Mars Volta's first album, that they last in the Comatorium. That's a great one, yeah. I think sounds great. I think note for note's great. It's uh, experimental enough without being too full of itself that it, it sort of touches on, like I love a lot of like older sort of space rock kind of uh, prog stuff. And they sort of touch on yes and shit like that without just being like way over the top on that record. And then they kind of just, I feel like they just totally went downhill from there. But yeah, I, I, I mean, they, they, they went down the unlistable pike, but I agree that first record is just fantastic. I think there's, yeah, there's choruses and it's, <laughs> well, know, I think it's there's great. even songs that work the way that record works. And they they like do cool songs after that record for the next two records. But then it just like, as a record listening experience, like that record, like you can listen all the way through, but like, Oh, after that, like, hell no. Yeah, then they started producing their own stuff. I think I read a quote where they were like, uh, well, why do we need a producer? Why would anyone know what we should sound like more than us? 
It's like, well, maybe you should go back and listen to your first record because someone kept you in check. Yeah, it, it really is true. Is that they, the self indulgence uh, of their compositions just got so bad after a while. Yeah, like noise for noise sake. You know, it's like I don't want to. No one wants to hear you sit there and just play with your echo pedal for for six minutes. Well, you also, you know, when you read that Vice article on how dude was uh, buying a thousand dollars a pot a day, <laughs> it all starts to make sense. <laughs> Drugs never work out right <laughs> for anyone. Well, I mean, I, Bill Maher has that great quote of uh, "You want to ban heroin? Uh, my record collection's a great argument against it." <laughs> yeah, you may be able to write great, but yeah, everything else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the rest of your life's going to descend into other hell. But I'm also. Uh, I know you're you're probably not a huge Floyd fan, but oh yeah, no, I I I, I greatly enjoy Pink Floyd. I know you but, love Pink Floyd. Yeah, they're probably my favorite band. But uh, everyone thinks that they're just oh, those guys must have been on so many drugs and blah blah. blah. And any interview, they're just like, no, nah, we didn't. Uh, like Roger Waters said, he did acid once, and it was the worst night of his life. Wow, I did not know this. But obviously, Sid Barrett, different story. Yeah, yeah, Sid but, was but, first, but I, he was I, only on the first would, record. Yeah, I was gonna say you and I are both bigger fans of later than Sid Barrett stuff. Yeah, so it's like, you know, if Pink Floyd, like one of the ultimate like acid rock bands weren't on acid, you know, like Yeah, that that's kinda telling. You don't need the drugs. <laughs> um so so getting into your personal taste, tell me about five of your favorite records in your musical growth. Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here. And so so what did you learn from that record? The the clean tone at the beginning of it is is probably my favorite. My favorite clean tone. And David Gilmore is my favorite guitar player. And it's just like, he doesn't noodle. It's like every note is melodic and it fits where it's like every note and every hit and every, everything just seems to be like what it should be. Like there's no. It's, it's, it's considered is what I've been liking to say these days. Yeah. And the, uh, the use of like dynamics as far as like most of their records, you know, like the, I think the opening track is it's like 13 minutes long or something like that. It's like you don't hear the voice until like three minutes in where it's like a lot of stuff today. is just like, well, if you don't get to the chorus by half uh, 30 seconds in, blah, blah, blah. And it's like to me, I don't know. I don't care. Then you're just writing to try and be something. Mm -hmm. The statistics is today that the vocal on the average top 10 song enters within four seconds on a pop song. Yeah, which is crazy, which all the but all the timeless records and all the records that are considered great over time usually aren't really like that you know there's longer intros there's longer songs can be a little longer and that's the stuff i that, that's stuff that i like it's like more interesting as opposed to <clears throat> you know although i do love tom petty's don't bore us get to the chorus because sometimes that fits so so tell me about another record u2's octune baby so it's another one of the most interesting listens. You know what? I and I I always just say it, but I don't know if I'm just, just pulling this out of my ass. But was was there guitar tones like that before Octune Baby, or was Edge? I know there was effects pedals. Everyone had effects pedals, but was that the first record that guitar? It's like that's a fucking guitar. So I think that there was like this thing that like Eno, oddly enough, like Steve Vai, who's so thing, but like there's kind of this thing. There's the Eno and the Zappa camp. I want to say. Those were the people who were like getting into that Eventide Harmonizer, which I think is a lot of that record. Like, so then you also have like what Eno did with like uh, David Byrne on My Life in the Bushel of Ghosts and all that stuff. All that is where like the kind of real experimental guitar stuff I think came. And Robert Fripp, obviously, with Bowie and stuff like that. That's where I think that was all coming from. But that's all Eno lineage or Zappa people. Like, really, that's where I think you got a lot of that stuff from. King Crimson's influence, stuff like that. Yeah. And well, and another thing that's to me that's really impressive about that record is the prior to that, their proper studio record was Joshua Tree. So a complete 180 of the sound of a band, like Joshua Tree and Octoon Baber, like night and day different like styles, and they became even bigger. Which is, you know, it's like so to me, it's like, well, don't be afraid to do something different or have longer parts or, you know, do something out of the norm because it, it works. <laughs> you know, it can work. Well, and you, you, know what, you, you know, now that I think about it, too, Octung Baby is a post-Pretty Hate Machine record. So I think that there's, while Octung Baby is a much more polished record, Nine Inch Nails definitely had an influence on everybody, and everyone who heard that was like, okay, this is something. 
you know, some of those synthy, like the guitars are almost synths at some parts. Yeah, and it's the same thing. It's the using the DSP, Eventide DSP 4000 and the H3000 um, that they had the guitar versions of that. That is just those two records to a T. That is the trick. Yeah. So what else? Oh, Sigur Ross's Tack album. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a great record. Uh, love that. Kid A, by Radiohead. Yoshimi Battles Pink Robots. Another great one. Uh, the production, the, the drums on that are, are incredible. Yeah. Well, it's like funny, like, you know, like if you like the soft bulletin's a little bit more of the AM pop one, and then that one gets into like, they started listening to like Warp Records stuff and like got a little more wild with the like electronics. I think that was a good meeting of their pop thing versus their progressive thing. Yeah, I feel like you could tell that it seemed like the next record is, you know, from soft bullet in it was like the next record i think is going to be the one and to me then the, you know then it was yoshime which is kind of like uh pink floyd's metal record it's like you kind of felt like the next one is going to be the the one then it was dark side so sometimes you can kind of tell with bands that it's like yeah they're about to be onto something yeah and then i guess more like folky stuff i think shoots too narrow by the shins is where i don't really I'm not the biggest fan of how it sounds it's just one of my favorite records. You know, it's funny, like, because, like, isn't that the thing, like, so Phil Lech mixed it, but, like, the dude had, like, a really cheap home computer setup, and that's where a lot of those tones come from, is that he was using some shitty, I want to say he was using, like, Acid or Soundforge or something for a huh. lot of those keyboards, if I remember how it went, and then Phil Lech would have to make them sound good, despite them coming from a Sound Blaster 16 card. <laughs> But the songs were great, and, you know, they, I guess, right after that, they got huge right after that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that record even was pretty big, but, yeah, they, they got monumental. So what's your favorite record that's come out recently and what inspires you about it? Maybe uh, the the new, I don't know how how new it is, maybe the past year, I guess the War on Drugs record I, okay. I think is really great. I have not, not heard much of it in the past, uh, hearing it come on the radio on my dad's serious. <laughs> yes. I, I, I have animosity to that guy because he dates Kristen Ritter and I'm jealous so <laughs> it's you know what it's about? it's like they kind of just sound like to me they sound kind of like Dire Straits but like I don't know I like the track one is like nine minutes long and it's like to me that's that's great for, for an album to come out today to have it like a nine minute opening track and I think it kind of rocks I think it's great nice so tell us what you've been working on lately just started the new brick and mortar album awesome uh, so that's an lp yeah it'll be a full length i'm not sure exactly how many songs yet but you know it's at, at least 10 10 or 12 somewhere nice. in there oh i've been doing uh i guess it's been the past four years this dude's been recording oh my god i want to say it's probably like 75 songs or something like that so far because he's working on an audio book that's 14 hours, 14 hours long. Holy shit. It's uh, an autobi an autobiography. Uh, the dude's like a, a recovering, like paranoid schizophrenic. who's like real open about his, you know, his descent, I guess, into it. And like figuring out like when he learned what was wrong with him and, and getting treatment and then like how to cope with it. And oh, he's got these crazy, like really funny stories, but like super insane. So the music that we've been doing the past four years is like underneath the entire audiobook, and he's he narrates he narrates the entire thing. And there's a couple other couple of songs we got to do. I have someone like arranging like for like a twelve. I guess it's a twelve piece. I think one. I don't know if that's it's not considered an orchestra, or maybe it is considered an orchestra at that point. But it's like an arranger arranging some of the songs for for strings and piano and and like oboe and shit. It's crazy. Wow, that sounds pretty cool. But this dude, I don't. I think like in the world of paranoid schizophrenics, he's like well known. Hmm. I didn't know there was a world of paranoid <laughs> schizophrenics, but that's yeah, interesting. Like, like I don't know whatever the magazine would be. It's not like Schizophrenics Monthly or you know <laughs> whatever it would be. But he's like he, like doctors have used him. I forget the percentage, but it's like I want to say like five percent of people who are paranoid schizophrenics like actually come out of it and can live a normal life and the rest of them just wind up like talking to walls and shit like mm -hmm. that yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's right. crazy to hear his stories and his he wrote it's like a 400 page book and it's like it's really funny and really good and it should mm. be done by the new year actually kick ass Jan january or something like that and then then what he does with that i don't know maybe he'll try and get on ellen or something but seems like a compelling good story but it's been a hell of a hell of a project <laughs> and it's, it's, it's gonna be great 
Cool, dude. Well, thank you so much for doing this. That's all we got. Cool. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember the golden rule of the internet, that if you enjoy something you got for free, please tweet, Facebook, share, or tell your friends about it in whatever way you like to do that. Please check out Noise Creator's website and take a look around. We have tons of interviews, discographies, Spotify playlists from all the best producers out there on our service. If you're unsure about who your band should work with, we can help you get the best producer fit for your record. To keep up with us, follow at Noise Creators on Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud, Tumblr, or Facebook. This podcast can also be found wherever podcasts are found, including iTunes and Stitcher. I'm your host, Jesse Cannon. I can be found on Twitter at Jesse Cannon or at jessecannon.com. Again, please help spread the word about this podcast and what Noise Creators does so we can keep this going. 